uh, Jason Little here to talk to us today. Uh, welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. Um, so Jason is an international speaker, author, um, longtime Agile coach. Uh, he wrote, uh, I think, two books, right? Lean Change Management and Change Agility. Um, I have read Lean Change Management, and it is very good. I can't say that I've read Change Agility yet, but I'm sure it is very good as well. Um, and Jason might not remember this, but uh, the first time that we met was actually fairly early in my uh, sort of agile journey. Um, probably seven, eight years ago, he was teaching a Management 3.0 course with Jurgen Apello that I attended, and it was, mm -hmm. a, it was an awesome course. So that was a, not the beginning of my journey, but pretty early on, and it, was, it certainly helped me continue. So thank you for that as well. Um, cool. So Jason, go ahead. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so who, who has ever had, you know, a neighbor move in next door? Thumbs up or reaction thumbs up. I won't be able to see everybody at the same time. I will say flip back and forth. All right. So um, did you go on Google and Google best practices for integrating with neighbor next door? Or did you go get certified in something or follow some eight step method. And yeah, Jeff, I saw you nod. Yeah. What, what was the method? Uh, I got certified in new neighbor, new neighbor integration. Oh, uh, okay. I think I heard about that. Uh, NNI. Step, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Step one is um, assess the current state. So you write down a list of all of your hobbies and things that you like, and then you mail a letter to your neighbor and then they do the same. And then you send that to a neutral location and then you kind of compare um, and then once you've got that assessment done, then now you can go ahead and build your plan for how you're going to uh, figure out how to integrate that one. Was that similar to the one that? Yep, that's yeah. basically it. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, except we don't mail letters, we use uh, teletype. Oh, But same okay. idea. Yeah, yeah, mm, very cool. Um, so obviously that's pretty silly. What do you do if somebody moves in next door? Sorry, let's just say when we were allowed to leave our houses, what would you do if somebody moved in next door? Just take walk over. Take him some food. Yeah, walk over with a batch of cookies and say hello. Yeah. S sometimes when it comes to change in our organizations, we just lose our minds and we forget that it all comes down to relationships and interactions between people. We just desperately want all the people in our organizations to act and behave like robots so we can apply something to them to get them to do this thing, whatever the change is. Um, and it, it's never really worked that way. It's never gonna work that way, but we're kind of stuck always wanting to find what's the next big thing that's gonna get us over the hump and kind of past some of these, these problems. So what I wanted to talk about here was um, the, just something called the five universals of change. It's been kicking around in my brain, I guess, for uh, a couple of years. Um, and it, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of origin about where it came from and then get into some stories. And then we're going to try a game, a little card game online. Um, so I'll give you those instructions a little bit later on. We'll do those in, um, in breakout rooms. It's designed to be played with uh, kind of a smaller group of people, but we'll see if we can make it work with with a bit of a uh, larger audience. So uh, the game, it's, uh, it's, it's a game called Tapezia, and it's not an Italian game. Uh, Tapezia is kind of a made up Finnish word, meaning the most important thing. Uh, so it's not a real word. It was created by the, the guy on the right. Um, hopefully he's just showing up on the right of your screen, UC Gala. And um, it's based on, you know, how can we find <laughs> out what's the most important thing for us to be able to move this change forward. So how do we understand our context? How do we understand kind of where we're at, where we want to go? And how could we try on a different set of lenses to, to look at this change? So this was kind of born from the most boring world tour of change management ever, because that's the least rock and roll thing you could possibly say. I went on a world tour of change management. It's like, yeah, sweet. Um, and just started connecting with change agents. And that <coughs> word, when I use that word, that can mean anybody. You know, who's a, who's a developer that has wanted to switch source control 
from one tool to another. Has anybody tried doing that or you wanted to bring in like a different tool or something like that? You're doing some type of change management. Um, and sometimes for some people, it just comes natural and it's pretty easy. So I was in this big transformation. Um, it was New Year's Eve day. Uh, the organization shall remain nameless to protect the innocent. And just sitting there after, I don't, I think it was seven or eight months or so, just wondering that, you know, this agile stuff isn't that hard. Isn't it pretty simple? Like it's simple, but not easy. Just why can't anybody get this? I don't get it. This is pretty simple. You know, get some people who get some cross-functional people together that work on stuff, push the decision-making down, focus on the customer. You know, this isn't really hard to do. And I was just sitting there thinking, you know, none of this is working. Um, I'm going to go back to cutting grass or just to, to completely get out of this career because I can't understand why these folks don't get it. And just wrote a post um, around, there's got to be a better way to approach change. I think, you know, back then there wasn't as much information about how Agile affects the whole organization as there is today. Like back then, as much as there was, you know, comments around, it's not a magic bullet, it's not just an IT thing, it was very much sold as a magic bullet and sold as an IT thing, because that's just the way it was. You could argue there's still some of that going on today. Um, but at least there's a lot more awareness about the organizational change impact of it. And uh, uh, short, short version, um, that led to a bunch of different things. If anybody remembers Front Row Agile, I don't think they're around anymore. There was uh, originally there was Safari Books Online and Inform IT. And um, the uh, I did a talk based on that blog post and Pearson Education wanted to do a book on that topic. They said nobody's really talking about this Agile and change stuff. Um, and of course, I did nothing. And then eventually that led to the uh, video lesson series that um, Lisa Adkins and I started for uh, uh, Pearson Education. She did her coaching Agile teams and I did an Agile transformation one. Um, and it just kept building and building and building. And I started getting more connected to the change world and the organizational change world and um, not totally stepping away from the Agile world, but just, you know, peeking on, peeking over the fence and seeing what was going on over there. And then that led to the, the first version of the book, the second one, and then going around to all sorts of companies, sizes and shapes in a variety of different countries. And through that process, finding out that there's, there's some universal principles that are very similar to things that people just know. Like if somebody moves in next door, you bring over a basket of fruit or some muffins or some cookies and you say, hey, how's it going? I'm Biff. I live next door. Just wanted to introduce myself. I'll let you get settled. You know, here's my number. If you need anything or whatever, um, you guys are welcome to come over for dinner. As humans, we just know that, right? You don't have to teach people that. Except for weird, socially awkward people like me who kind of act like an alien sometimes and don't understand this, this human uh, relationship stuff. Um, but there's hey, certain, Jason, you, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, there's just a note in the chat here. Any chance you could go into presentation mode just to make the slides a little bit bigger and easier to read? Uh, sure. Thanks. Okay. Oh, good. I didn't because I thought that might wreck. I wouldn't be able to see people down here in my other monitor, but I can. Groovy. Um, so it turns out, yeah, there are certain universals that it doesn't matter what size company it is or industry or country. Uh, there's certain universals that help us figure out how to move change forward. It's not scientific. It's not a tried and true backed by science and 4 million case studies that are not entirely true. It's more asking people how they were getting stuck, why they were getting stuck, and what was getting them loose. Like what was helping them nudge things forward in their organization. Um, and... Yeah, yeah, skip past this stuff. So I had a great big stack of sticky notes from every class um, and every visit, uh, every engagement anywhere with all of this information and then clustered all of it together and then found these, these patterns. And these patterns led to, um, I guess, just, just an approach of what would happen if we looked at things differently? Not so much um, 
what we usually do when it comes to change. Like, how do we overcome this resistance? How do we get those people to do that? So most of the questions were along those lines from people. You know, how can I get those people to do that? How do I get those people to buy in? How do I apply agile to change or how do I overcome resistance? A lot of it was just external stuff related. You know, um, me, everything's good. I did everything well and good as the coach, consultant, change person, whatever, but all y'all resisted and there you go. That's where we're at. The change didn't work because everybody resisted change. Has anybody seen the version one surveys? State of agile surveys. I think this is 15th. The 15th one? I don't know if it's yeah. out yet, but I know they started collecting uh, stuff for the 15th one. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why organizations say they struggle with Agile is because of resistance to change. And it's been the same percentage of response for 15 years. So either we're not getting any brighter as a community, or that's just kind of a catch-all of, I, I don't know what happened, but it was all y'all's fault and not mine because you resisted. So this information, again, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was a medium-sized company, a giant bank, or whatever. It was all the same reasons people were getting stuck, and it was the, these five patterns that was helping them get unstuck. And there's the interesting thing was the difference in perspective between internal and external change agents. You know, internal change agents have more of a luxury of time, and feel free to throw stuff in the in the in the chat too. Um, I just popped that open, so I'll see that as well. Um, you know, who's been an internal and external change agent? Would you say it's different? Feel free to throw anything in the chat. Um, if you're there, you're in it for the longer term. You can kind of try some things out. You can wait it out. You can see how things happen. You can wait till certain teams or people in the organization are ready. But if you're external, you almost get kind of locked into this I have to buy this date because, you know, I've got a three month contract, I've got a six month contract or whatever it is. So you naturally kind of get into a push type of approach when sometimes a push based approach is kind of at odds with this, the place the organization is at the time. Um, an interesting uh, observation about that is, have you ever had somebody on a team or a client come up to you and say, hmm, you know, I think we should uh, start doing method X or we should start doing this thing or we should change this thing. What do you think? And it's something that you told them eight months ago, but now it's their idea because they thought of it. Has anybody seen that? You just kind of want to stab them in the eye with a fork. You're like, why didn't you listen to me eight months ago? You hired me to do this and nobody wanted to listen. Like that's the victory. That's the, it, sometimes it just takes people a while for them to really understand how Agile is affecting their organization and what they really want to do. Um, so these five things, I'm going to just go through each of the five things, tell a quick story, and then we'll, we'll hop into the game. Um, people, you might be familiar with John Cotter's eight steps, throw a yes in the chat um, if, if you've heard of it. Um, it's, it's eight steps. It's not intended to be steps that you follow, uh, but number one is create urgency. You know, how do you create urgency? You have to create urgency for change or nothing will change. Now, the problem with that is it's kind of biased from the perspective of the organization or the leaders. Like it's urgent for us, for you people to do this change because company's not making enough money, shareholders aren't happy, whatever the reason is, but it's usually the urgency is biased from the perspective of organization or people at the top. Like that doesn't necessarily help people on a team feel urgency. So Cotter warns about this, he calls it false urgency. You know, don't paint the sky is falling type of false sense of urgency because um, that just doesn't work. But what if we flipped the conversation away from that and more towards having a common purpose? One of the, the banks in the Nordics I did some work for, their purpose was the financial well-being of their citizens. And they're the only large financial organization that I've been in or done training or worked with or whatever that that took that stance but actually behaved in a way that was congruent with that purpose they would openly admit that they're going to make things worse for their customers for the next two years while they tear everything down or rebuild it back up and that's everything from systems to culture and everything it was quite unique but they had a deeper sense of purpose so if we can shift the conversation to away from this fake urgency and more towards helping people rally around a, a cause and a purpose, 
we're more likely to move things in a more positive direction. And this was a, a, a company that they expected to double in size over uh, the course of a year. And they thought, well, we're going to need Agile to be able to do that. So let's hire an Agile coach. So I talked to them, went in, did a couple of sessions. And what they realized was they, they needed some kind of intervention so they would know that they're still kind of facing the right way. They didn't want to grow um, tall, as in hierarchy. Specifically, it's what they said. We don't want to wake up a year from now and have 12 layers of management because it'll be impossible to get stuff done. We also don't want to wake up in a year and everything's totally off the rails. Like there's, there's no guardrails in place to stop us from um, just having total chaos. So we did this uh, Lego serious play session and this model here that you can see was interesting because all the little parts uh, that are scattered was basically all the things that they've changed uh, over the company's existence. And they realized that they're actually a lot more resilient than they gave themselves credit for. They realized that they're really good at reinventing themselves when they need to. And that's what actually helped them figure out how to move forward. Now, skeptics, you could argue that's firefight mode and reaction mode. I'm never not really a fan of that term because response to the market is what we want because we can't control the market. So there's a chasm of difference between, I think, what we often call firefighting and um, being resilient and reactionary to changing demands from our, from our customers. So that was great. They, they kind of explored a bigger purpose, moved forward, and they didn't need to hire me because they realized they didn't actually really need to change anything. So I was like, ah, oh, crap, that's no good for the wallet, but that's good for them. Um, I remember talking to them the first time just to go down this side dirt road. And they said, you know, they, re they really wanted to understand how would we measure the effectiveness as a, as a, as a coach? Like, how would we know that it's been successful that we've had you here? I said, well, I'll put a big board up in the lobby with how much you're paying me and have people rate it from zero to 10 if they got their money's worth. And they kind of looked at me sideways and they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. And I totally wish they would have done that because that would have been such an awesome picture to share and show. But um, anyway, yeah, the, these guys were great. They, it gave them a good rallying point to move forward. The, the second one was, you know, we talk about when we talk about communicating, what I discovered over the years was most organizations were substituting broadcasting for communication. So, you know, you've all heard all the change management things we need to communicate. You need to tell people the same thing 20 times. You need to blah, 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 blah. But it ends up manifesting itself in broadcasting. Or, you know, who's been part of a, a scripted town hall? where the leaders are going to go on stage and they're going to say, this is an open conversation, but you've got the, the change people behind the scenes that are handing out questions to people because they want to see people, they want, they want the leaders to be seen answering these questions. We want to get a, there's a time and place for giving people information and there's a time and place for having meaningful dialogue. You know, this, this is one of the things Cotter talks about when he warns about false urgency is we have to have honest conversations about this. So organizations that were able to move towards meaningful dialogue where leaders are listening and not telling and change people are moving from a manager approach to a change facilitator role and facilitating and brokering that conversation were more likely to do something with more impact and meaning. So an example would be this was um, the, um, the financial organization in the Nordics. We used to do uh, these sessions um, Every quarter, there were certain rituals. Every six months, there was bigger rituals. And we would get 200 people in a room together, close the chapter on the previous year of change or previous six months, whatever the time horizon was. And then we'd open up the book for the next three months, six months, year, whatever the time horizon was. And we were using a tool called Slido, which works really well unless you leave it too open and you get some, some folks in a session that are asking some awesome, interesting questions. Nobody on this call would have done something like that. No. <laughs> so we have the CEO and the CTO on stage. Who's used Slido before? It's um, 
app for your phone, you type in a question, you hit send, and anonymously it shows up uh, on the screen. So we had three big screens behind the leaders. People are asking questions in real time. We're doing feedback polls like this. Um, and, and it's all public for people to consume. It's not scripted. It's not curated. The best question that was asked was uh, the CTO was on stage and somebody had asked, you keep telling us why we need to change. What are you prepared to change? Like who's going to stand up with a microphone in a town hall in front of the CEO and CTO of a you know conservative financial organization and ask that question? Like maybe Jeff, but... <laughs> but um and the great thing was none of these are being filtered so obviously that gets voted right up to the top and the cto nailed the answer like it wasn't your typical corporate response it was well here's the things i don't like about how i manage today and i don't like you know i play competitive sports i'm highly competitive i like things to get done I, i'm very results oriented sometimes i push harder than i probably should and that's something i need to learn and i was like oh my god so when you talk about meaningful dialogue, you know, what are we afraid of as change people? If we can't talk about these things, nothing's going to change. We're going to end up with, you know, if you've been part of a, a transformation or a change that seemed kind of superficial, like throw a yes in the chat where it's kind of like you've heard the metaphor of moving the chairs around on the Titanic. It just, it doesn't matter. Um, if we can't get to these meaningful conversations, nothing is really going to move ahead in a meaningful way. And as change agents, it's our responsibility to help facilitate those. Obviously, there's a tactful way to go about it. We were very transparent with these leaders that this is the approach we're going to take. This is, we think this is the best way to do it. Why? And they all agreed. And they wanted to engage in those conversations. Uh, the CEO would actually go uh, every week and do a roundtable with 50 random employees and not talk, just listen and actually challenge the employees. If he felt they were holding back, he's like, you know, I'm not getting the real story about what's going on. Tell me. If I don't know, I can't help, which was so awesome. The, the third one, this one's obvious, experimenting over executing change tasks. Who's been part of a change where, you know, you spent the $2 million budget, status reports green, and nothing's different. You know, transformation's been around for so long now. I remember back in the, you know, the late 2000s when it was new for a lot of the larger companies here in Toronto. Um, so you're kind of fumbling around in the dark trying to figure out how to do this. But they've been doing the same thing every year for the last 10 years. There's always a new transformation program with a new method, a new approach, a new set of consultants, a new VP of agile, innovation, business agility, whatever it just it keeps going and i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying if we keep following that same pattern and nothing is changing that's a good sign that change isn't really needed you know somehow agile's made process improvement a bad word and in some contexts that might be the best approach it really depends but we won't know unless we experiment and we need people in the organization to be willing to want to do that. So it's not up to us for the change agents to decide that they should be doing this. It's up for us to, to um, kind of uh, provide a container for that conversation so they can make a more well-informed choice. You know, if we just want to bring in a framework to make software build faster, let's be congruent about that. Let's not talk about transformation and we want to do mindsets and culture and all this type of stuff. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's, let's say that we're after process improvement and let's be congruent about it. Because I think nowadays, you know, back then it sounded great for a lot of people and organizations, but today a lot of people see through that. They see through the mask of, you know, it's, this is just Biff, the new VP, that's, you know, their favorite thing today. Tomorrow it'll be something else. So you, you, if you've heard the term, the, the rope-a-dope kind of response where, where people on teams, they just kind of go along with it because they know there's going to be something new next. So if we can get away from just executing those tasks, uh, the change world likes to separate project management and change management. If you go on LinkedIn, you'll see there's still so many posts and articles about, you know, is this time, the time to merge the two? but they like to keep them separate. Like the project managers handle all the logistical stuff and all the tasks and all that stuff and the change people handle all the people stuff. And those two shall not intertwine. There are roles and responsibilities on both sides. We need separations of concerns. Um, 
and I would argue it should be the opposite, right? It's one and the same. It's one and the same. It's changing your stance. So this was um, in an organization where, um, let's just say they, they, they didn't have a really good, they didn't have really good technical practices and the platform was not in the best of shapes. Um, kind of to the point of, you know, 10,000 line JSP files, 6,000 line methods, no unit tests, just really, really bad shape. And all 16 teams had their own branch. And one of the patterns that people noticed was when the build was broken, everybody checked in because they were just like, woohoo, it's like party time. Nobody will be able to figure out what happened. So screw it. We'll just, everybody will just, we'll dump all of our stuff in and let the build and integration team figure it out. That's their responsibility to merge. Um, and uh, <laughs> no es bueno. Um, so we put this siren up and this picture is very crappy because this was in the iPhone 3G days. So that should tell you how old the, the story is. And the interesting thing that happened is that this wasn't put in place as a punishment. This was an experiment uh, with an early warning signal. Does anybody, when you could work in an office, did anybody use uh, Philips Hue bulbs as a visual indicator for stuff? Like this is just an interesting trick. You can do some really cool things with, with Philips Hue bulbs. Like you could trigger lights to come on in certain colors for certain events and actions, which would be a lot easier. We had to use like a radio frequency uh, transmitter for this siren to be able to get this to work. So build would break, siren would go on, build team would lock out, check in. They just wouldn't allow anything to happen. They would go look at the logs. They'd find out what happened. They'd go back to the team and they would say, you know, they would use it as a training opportunity. So that experiment helped actually there, they have a really interesting process in place where their, their training process is kind of official now for everything across the board from UI standards to uh, CSS naming conventions and a whole pile of other stuff. So there's, they, they still have the same, obviously they don't have the siren anymore, but they still have the same approach. As senior technical people, our responsibility is to train people, not punish them if they do something wrong, which is awesome. And it kind of started from that experiment. Um, this one's my favorite. This has always been my favorite. Um, we always like to blame resistance because it's fun, right? It's, it's fun to talk about the frozen middle or it's fun to talk about how those people don't get it and the executives, they don't get it and all this type of stuff. But there's really, people are just are reacting to some event or trigger or intervention no reaction is no good. Like a really strong negative reaction actually is a really, really good thing. That's really good data to say things like, maybe it's not the right time for the change, maybe it's the wrong change, but it's giving you data about why something is off. And now we have to get curious instead of furious. And we have to go figure out where's that disconnect, where you know, leaders are asking us to push this change down, teams are pushing back, as we like to say, well, why is that? Um, and once we start to kind of pick at those things and we start to look back and forth and we start to get people uh, together to have conversations, we can find out how we can use how people are reacting to change. Like the best we can do is change people is react to that reaction. You know, coming up with a, with a resistance to change mitigation plan just sets us up for a fight from the start. Right. If we kind of go into change, seeing it as a battle, um, does anybody still use the term uh, war room anyway? That used to be the thing, right? Production goes offline. Let's get a war room together and get people in a room. Yeah, like these things like a war room and creating this resistance mitigation plan and God forbid the stupidest change management phrase ever, the burning platform. Has anybody heard that term before? Does anybody know the origin of that term? Feel free to unmute and say it out loud or type it in the chat. Does anybody know where that, the origin of that phrase comes from? Burning platform? It's from the 16th century, isn't it? Oh, is it that old? No, I don't know. I'm just making that up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it's, archaic, though. It, it's the first translation of Kanban. So right now it means not scrum. But, you know, back then it meant, no. Um, 
it's literally from uh, oil rigs in the ocean. Burning platform. The platform is, is burning. Jump off or you're going to die. Like what a horrible metaphor for change. So if anybody's still using it or hears people using it, you know, for shame them. It's terrible. It's a terrible metaphor. But when we go to resistance and burning platform and push-based, we, we put ourselves in the mode of thinking that transformation and change is going to be a fight. And it puts us in a certain attitude and disposition towards the change. And that's generally not helpful. I mean, anybody who's worked in a telecom knows that those cultures can be pretty harsh sometimes. And sometimes there is a bit more push involved at the start. Um, but if we're always kind of in that mode, it doesn't help us help people. Um, this was uh, in a retrospective with a bunch of managers. And uh, I was working with uh, Andrew Annett. And I know some of you folks know, know him. He's a coach up here um, in Canada. And he wrote this on the flip chart for the manager retrospective. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the times working in these transformations as a coach or change agent or whatever, do you ever feel like you're just in the way? Like you walk into the meeting and people are like, oh, here comes that coach again or that agile coach or whatever. Um, and we felt we were in the way. So he wrote this on the wall. What are you tolerating? Um, that was probably one of the best conversations that we had because that really helped the, this group of these managers understand that we were there to help and support. Whereas the perception sometimes is, and I know I've felt like this a lot of times being parachuted into an organization, that you're there to fix people. Right? You show up for your first meeting with a team and they're just like, great, management hired another babysitter for us. And you're kind of, you're, you're already starting a little bit behind. Um, and our attitude was certainly one of trying to be helpful, but sometimes you know, trying to be helpful doesn't always work. So we had this really great conversation and they gave us some awesome information and it helped us just get past um, that and helped us build a better relationship with them. Um, and the last one, buy-in is another thing that's pretty popular in the change world. I, I would get a lot of questions over the last number of years. How do I get management to buy into the change, whatever it is? And my question is always, Oh, what the heck are you doing there? Like, if nobody wants to change, why are you there? Who's asking for it? Where is it coming from? Where is the disconnect? So it's not, you know, we don't need to sell cars to people. Um, if we co-create, there's nothing to sell. Not everybody's going to like it. And that's another one of the myths with change management is that, you know, you, you get an assessment and you do a change readiness and you get people aware of it and you make them have some desire for it. And then we go into execute mode, but I've never seen a change, worked on a change where everybody aligned to the purpose of the change at the same time in the same place in the same way. It just doesn't happen. Humans are not that way. You know, try to get 10 people at a party to agree on pizza toppings. It'll never happen. And hopefully if we ever are allowed to be around more than 10 people at a time, you can try that experiment and see how it goes. Um, but the idea is, you, this is kind of the, the oldest uh, trick in the book is the people who are doing the work are best suited to figure out how to do the work. So if we co-create together, great question I like to ask from the top, if the top is trying to push change on the bottom, what evidence do you need to see from the teams that they're moving in the direction you want them to go? And the same question to the teams. Here's ideally, you know, you bring the top and the bottom together for that conversation, but sometimes in bigger organizations, it's not always possible. So from, you know, the people on the teams, what evidence can you provide that shows that you're moving towards the, the, the state that we want to get to versus trying to centralize our, you know, our, our uh, metrics and, and all these types of things. So this organization, um, the top left is the perspective of the organization. So why does the organization want this change? Um, on the top right, why does the management team want this change? And at the bottom, what's in it for the teams and the people? And so we just looked at uh, similarities and differences between them to try to figure out how do we move forward together. But we did that together. So the, the whole idea is balance. And this is really where the change agent comes into play. There's no recipe or playbook or steps or best practices to follow that work every time. It's more about knowing when is the right approach at the right time. 
and you can't always know until you've done it. Um, but m the majority of the people that I talked to over the last number of years, if they were focused more on meaningful dialogue more often than not, they were more likely to get people involved and interested, bring in second and third order change agents who are kind of virally spreading change through the organization, um, getting people engaged versus, you know, sending out a newsletter or something like that. So it's definitely, it's always interpreted as a, a right and wrong. Like how many times have you seen the manifesto misinterpreted where people say, well, we don't plan anymore. We're, we're agile. The manifesto says you don't plan, you respond to change, which obviously is not true. Um, so it's, it's about how do we balance these things in the right way at the right time. And the way we do that is through this game that we're going to try out. Um, the, it's based on an, uh, an actual card game. There's 52 philosophies associated to these universals. And I went really loosey-goosey calling them universals and philosophies on purpose um, because there's too many, you know, I, I've always been in the camp that methods and frameworks and things, they, they can't have principles and values. They just can't. They're inanimate things. They publish them, yes, but they're either published for marketing to sell stuff or it's the reflection of the creator's values and principles. But people have principles. These are just different glasses to try on. So if we looked at change through this philosophy and we thought about it that way, what could be different for us? And it tries to put the, um, the thinking back into change. You know, we want chefs. We don't want line cooks. There's a time and a place for a project management-based approach to change. That'll probably always be around. Um, but let's be congruent about that at least. So with this one, the way we would normally play this is everybody gets five cards. You pick a card that has a lens that sounds interesting to you. And then through a simple voting process, we try to find the number one for all of us. And then we create some experiments based on, you know, if we look at the one on the screen, um, when we're uncertain, we always invoke dialogue with people affected versus making better plans. So if that's something we want to fix, okay, we agree as a change team. Yeah, that's something we want to work on. That's the most difficult thing for us. What could we do? What were some experiments we could try over the next two weeks to move towards that way of working? So usually this is played with a change team. Um, whenever I run this with larger groups, I will usually will put people in breakout rooms of four to five, each breakout room represents a person. So I'll need one person from each breakout room to go to the URL. I'm going to put a code up on the screen to actually join the game and you'll, your room will play as a whole person. And um, I set the game up to look at two different perspectives. So the hard part about this is that we, we're not sharing a context. So you could just think of change or transformation in general. What's the most frustrating thing when, when the cards are dealt into your breakout room? As a breakout room, which one of those cards do you think is the most frustrating? Oh, I got some weird echo going on. Um, you'll vote on that. The second round will be now the flip side. What's the most inspirational thing? about how we do change. Then you'll vote on the number one of those two things, and then we'll get to experiment mode. So we'll probably take a little more time for round one. It'll go faster through round two. And don't worry, this always sounds confusing at this point, but it's, it's, it's a lot more simple uh, once we get into it. So I'm gonna get out of presentation mode and do, do, do. So I'm going to put, so you're going to go to, I'll put this in the chat now. Um, before I put it in the chat and before you join with that code, and this is just a disclaimer because um, uh, whoever puts in their email address, there may be a few seconds where your email address is shown on screen. And I got in trouble at another conference. Somebody was upset that their email address showed up for like a second and a half. And 
I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so don't put your email address into that URL with that code if you don't want the potential of it showing up on the screen. Because you know Jeff is sitting there with his camera waiting to take pictures to put you on every mailing list in the universe. And of course, I'm being silly. So that's the URL. And this is the code. I will see people joining on the list down here. So when I put you in your breakout rooms, then you know you guys can just decide one person from that room who, who wants to join the game online to represent your whole room. Not a hard and fast rule because I guarantee there's people who've already clicked the URL and who are already logging in because that always happens. It's not that big of a deal. Um, I'm going to deal the cards out to people and I'm going to send instructions through the broadcast function of Zoom. So, all right. So I think everybody is back or coming back. All right. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, like the, the one thing that's difficult is because we don't have a shared context, this is designed to be played with a team that has a shared context. So you just kind of had to make some stuff up. Um, and obviously there's more time for the discussions. So when you're choosing the most frustrating or the most inspiring, you get more time to talk about the situation that you're in and which ones that you want to vote on. So um, we've chosen, you know, the most, uh, we've chosen two. So conversations was the most inspiring. We always encourage open and honest uh, conversations, ask the hard questions. So now we have uh, two things to pick from. So this is the tapezia, and you have to say it like that, and you have to do the hand thing because it sounds like it should be an Italian word. Um, uh, so now we have to vote on the tapezia. Just to speed up the game, I'm just going to uh, do this here. So normally you would go back in a breakout room. You would say, okay, now which one of these do we want to focus on? Do we want to fix the most frustrating thing? Or do we want to do a spinal tap and turn this to 11 for the most inspiring thing and magnify that bright spot? Um, so you would have gone back and voted if I switch back to my player screen. So you would see the exact same screen, but now you're only voting on the last two to pick. I'll just move this one forward. And then now we get to the experimentation part. So now as a group, we've decided that we want to work on not doing really well at accepting failure. So we've got a little experiment thingy here that we can decide what actions to do. What activities could we do? And then come up with, um, uh, we want to do this. Uh, we're gonna give this one to Jeff because he needs to get some work done there. And Jeff, you gotta do this within a week. So you would create all your actions and then obviously give it five stars. The one thing that is uh, coming up for the future of this game is sometimes you don't always know what intervention you can do to kind of jiggle the change loose. So there's gonna be a link here that actually goes to a um, community site that has all of these philosophies on it, along with, you know, if you've chosen, say we picked leadership perspective, uh, there's a page for each card. Um, it gives you the text that's on the card a little bit more. And here's some practices that you can do to try to unstick things. And here's some stories from people that have tried something when they were in a similar spot. So the idea is to get to this global crowdsourced repository of stories and experiments that people are finding helpful to get unstuck. So in the game, there would be something down here under the card. Like, are you stuck? Click here and see what other people have done when they were in the same situation. Because the other, on top of the five universals and the perspectives and things, um, the, the social proof was more important. So even going into an organization as the so-called expert, which I hate that, um, people, or even in workshops, people are more likely to listen to their peers or, or listen to a story that they heard from somewhere else instead of, well, this sounds great in theory, uh, consultant person, but that'll never work here. But if they hear a story from somebody about something they tried, they're more willing to try it. So it's to try to take that viral and that social uh, aspect um, and relationships uh, into some system that's going to allow people to connect with anybody in the world. So 
you know, imagine you read the story and you like it. There's a little button there that says, hey, do you want to talk to Kevin about this? And obviously Kevin has to say, yes, it's okay for people to contact me. And then you can make a connection there, right? And you can share stories and connect people globally. So that's the intent of this. Um, I know the game is usually clunky in this type of situation, uh, just again, because we don't share the whole context, but that's really uh, the goal of it. And it's to help you create your own unique approach to change, something that's going to work and fit in your context. You know, it's going to look different for um, someone as opposed to someone else. So I guess with that, oh, and the last thing about this uh, online thingy is um, it keeps history. So I can end the game. I can go back and look at any game we've played. So if we're a global change team and we play this once a month, we can go back and we can look at um, previous times. Like what have we picked before and how has it worked? And it will start to, you'll start to learn yourself towards approaches for change that are most likely to work in your organization. Cause you'll see them all. Like I, I see all the games that I've played here, all the cards that were picked and the actions that we got to. So you'll actually have a history of your organization as to how you're progressing down your roadmap or what, what experiences you've had. Jason, you're, uh, you're muted. You can choose and you can choose what to make public or private. So you can share it across the whole organization. So imagine you have, you know, you're in an enterprise and you're working with 20 teams and you use the retrospective version of this game with 20 teams. Now you can go and see, like you can invite other teams to come and see what other teams have done. And obviously take that with a grain of salt because I think we know once stuff from the teams goes to the greater organization, sometimes there's a bit of things that kind of happen <laughs> to say it in a nice way. So you can keep things private or choose to make things public. Jason, it was really interesting in breakout room three, who, by the way, uh, actually won that second activity uh, with 35 points. Um, so congratulations to team three. But was really, what was really interesting in the conversation with five people in the room who all work in different places and all had different experiences, um, it was amazing how aligned and similar some of their some of the um, conversations were and how easy it was to come to alignment on some of the most frustrating things. It's almost like some of these things are universally frustrating. <laughs> Jeff, I'm gonna have to say that we're not aligned with you because I think our team won. So I'm, I'll have to disagree with you. You only got 15 points, which is less than 35. I'm sorry, Claire. They, they had 16 before, and then they got another 15. Sorry, Jeff. No, a different team. All right. I, I, I was keeping track. I don't know. I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> and if you ask Jeff, what do you get with these points? The answer is? Um, anyway, sorry. Was there another question? I heard, I think, another question. Jason, that was a, a great activity. Can you tell me a little bit more about how I, I might be able to use this with my team? I, I'm curious um, where this, this game or activity comes from. Uh, it comes from the land of ice and snow in Finland. Um, the, when you go to play.topazia.com, to play uh, you can pick, uh, I, I rem there's about 20 different uh, decks to use. So there's ones that are specific for agile. There's one specific for user experience. Um, I like to use them as retrospective tools. Like when I talk to change teams, usually in medium or larger organizations, they usually want to do change a different way. Or when people come to me, they say, how can I apply agile to change? Or how can I use, you know, that method to do this? We play the game um, to get them to just look through a different set of lenses, right? Like, it's, uh, I hate the term think outside the box because we can't, that's the whole, like we're in a box. If you're a coach in an enterprise, you're in the box. You can't think outside your context. Nobody's objective. 
it just doesn't work that way. Some people are obviously more self-aware, but the game will poke you to think about something a bit differently and then point you to some stories about what other people have tried. So it's definitely a longer term type of thing. So I, I insert it in retrospectives. And Jason, just a quick follow up to that too. So you said the team would you uh, the team would be more of like the change management team of an organization consisting of leaders and leadership. Would that be the 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 audience typically found for this uh, type of exercise, or is there? It's kind of a co-creative type of game. So you play it with the people that you need to play it with. So if you're doing this with, uh, you know, if you're restarting a transformation, um, it's great to do with all the stakeholders, you know, do one with everybody, right? Like get all, get the coaches of the 20 teams to run the game with the 20 teams, run it with a bunch of managers, run it with a bunch of leaders, and then look at the similarities and differences as a really good kind of intervention point to restart things. Got it. Yeah. Um, are there any other uh, questions or thoughts? Anyone want to put anything in chat maybe and I can uh, reflect it back if we need to. Well, it's Deb. I think it's just good to have the conversation in general about change and continue to talk about changing and where you want to go with the changes because they keep happening. And the only thing constant is change a lot of times. So kind of reflect on where you've come from and what's next and how we're going to get there. I think it's important to talk with everyone about that regularly. Jason, I had a quick question um, for you, um, maybe that you talked about, because when you talked about the five universal truths or the, the five approaches to change management, um, a lot of the things that you that that were that were were included there are the language that managers, leaders, executives, that they're the language that folks are familiar with right now. Um, wondering if you can share any thoughts about how you change or evolve the conversation to allow you to get into the other approaches that you shared with us tonight, given that they, they kind of run counterculture to the language that's used in change management um, and management in general so broadly. Yeah, the idea was to, to make it simple, easily accessible, um, but phrased to the way humans talk. Like change management can get a little buzzwordy and just weird sounding and uh, sometimes we try to make it sound more complicated than it is. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying if we can have conversations like humans have conversations, plain, clear, simple language, why are we stuck? How are we gonna get unstuck? Um, and we can be honest about that. It's, it's much better for everybody. It's so much less stressful. I find so the all the little saying or the the phrases on the cards were were written intentionally just to say that hey yeah methods and frameworks those things are well and good you get some good information from it but if if we can have these conversations um we're going to be in a much better spot great question in the chat from charu um if anyone doesn't see it there charu i don't know if you want to share share that question but yeah, I think sure. It, yeah sure go for it um so if you are a new agent new change agent into an organization which is undergoing digital transformation we often get this question from leaders hey what is your approach or framework to implement this change you know they they always expect that um that we we propose a framework or we tell them the eight steps or five steps or whatever number of steps we have and then give them a solution and then give them a roadmap as this is how we are going to implement this change mm -hmm. so uh, attending this uh, webinar is giving me a totally different perspective which is very liberating and refreshing 
So Jason, tell me how we can handle this question when leaders come and ask us, what's your framework or approach towards implementing a particular piece of change? I would say two major, um, I guess, uh, or the fork in the road to two, two different approaches. One is to play up the, the lean startup and agile angle. Um, you know, if we're playing, if we're, if we're trying to transform to agile or do a digital transformation, why don't we actually do it in the way that we want to work? Like if we want teams to experiment more and apply more design thinking, user experience, agile practices to building solutions for customers, why don't we take that same approach for change? So that's the approach we use. So one is kind of intentionally using that language to say, you know, we're feedback driven. Uh, we use the Scrum or Kanban or however we want to manage the change work and something that's very, very simple. Um, the actually, funny thing is I've had people ask, like, is there, is there like a, an enterprise deck that we like a bullshit deck that we can just give to people to get them off our back? Cause I find pretty much every agile coach or change agent already operates that way in the first place, but they have to do the dog and pony show to leaders. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a dog and pony show like deck that you can just give it to them and they'll be like, all right, cool. Cause they, they don't care about that stuff. They just want to know that you've thought about it. Okay. So, and then the second one is just start doing it. So when leaders have that conversation, do an exercise like a pocket principles exercise, presto manifesto, ballpoint game, or any really good um, agile exercise that helps them understand how agile works, if you want to say it that way, and then say, that's how we're going to approach change mm -hmm. in an incremental experimental way. And then they feel it. So it's like whichever of those two approaches is most likely to take you a step ahead. Some like the language and some like the experience. Yeah, I've yeah. had a question as well in the chat, Jason, just uh, just in the interest of time. I'm just going to pull that one up, Deb. Uh, great question on, on, on Jason. What's your biggest change success in your experience? They're all, it, it's a mix of things. The, the 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 failure success or kind of the binary it worked or it didn't from the view of the transformation program I find is less helpful because um, if if that's the answer you know what what worked according to the intent of the transformation and, and where all the benefits realized the answer is zero and it's probably zero for everybody whether we want to admit it or not change doesn't work that way but if you look at success as did people like coming to work more. Did people who really hated their job leave and go somewhere else? Uh, did we improve a whole pile of stuff for our customers? Uh, there's been tons. Um, I would say the, the financial organization and the Nordics at an enterprise level was probably the best one because uh, how many years? Probably f five years or so I was kind of in and out of there. So I got to see how things evolved over time. I got to see how their innovation programs actually impacted their customers. I got to see how some people just didn't like this and they went and got a job somewhere else that they liked better. I saw people liking their jobs more. Um, variety of different things. Those are my successes, really. It's it's because that's the whole point for me as a change agent is it's especially nowadays things are stressful enough people got enough stuff going on uh so my responsibility should be helping them figure out how to have a better work environment i feel jason a little bit like you've kind of just introduced us to some foundational and, and entry level things about change management and and lean change management if if we were interested in learning more like is there a besides your books which you know conflict of interest there but are there maybe courses that we could take or other things that you would recommend one of my favorite ones i'll put this in the chat uh um it, it uh organization mit's uh, organizational change course it's probably one of the best ones that, that I've taken because it focuses on stuff that matters. Um, it's online. They have a week-long in-person boot camp. They used to anyway. 
and now it's online. That one's a really great foundational one that really strips away the method and the frameworks and the noise and all that kind of stuff and really gets to stuff that actually matters. It's based on their four capabilities uh, leadership model. Um, and it's done really well. Just the way the online course is done, you actually work through a simulation, like a game where they give you, here's the context. It's a year long program. Here's all the things that you can do. And they all have points associated to it. And you do these actions and there's a bunch of videos from like CEOs to tell you how the organization reacted to it. It's like the choose your adventure book. If you remember those as a kid, that one's fantastic. It's probably one of the best ones that, that I've taken about change. And, and then obviously, cause yeah, it's probably a point to plug my own stuff, go to leanchange.org. And we've got a ton of workshops and stuff. We've got the enterprise agility, IC agile course now, plus the coaching agile transitions. And later this year, the, um, um, a, uh, a deeper program on top of those two. That's really cool. Awesome. Books made to stick and switch are still uh, kind of far and away my favorite uh, books on change because they, again, simplify things down to how humans change. We love change. Our society is proof that we love change. I thought for a second that you weren't going to plug a uh, lean change and I was going to have to plug it for you. <laughs> People know how to find it if they want it. That's kind of my philosophy. I'm a bad marketer. <laughs> it's Deb. I find it interesting. You say people love change, but then when people hear the word change, everybody's first, well, a lot of people's reaction is oh, what's changing. Oh no. So it's, it's interesting. Very, very interesting to talk about. I appreciate all the information. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Deb, that you say that, Jason. I'd, I'd love to just, sorry, I'm just picking up another question here, but I, I do think people love change. I don't think they like it when change is imposed on them. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to, Jason, get your take on that. It, am, I, am I off base with that? No, no, I think I, I would agree with that. I, I always go to, you know, there's the cutesy uh, quote, what is it? People don't, uh, people uh, don't resist change, they resist being changed. So yeah. if you tweet that out, you're going to get 4 million retweets because everybody goes, yay. But if you actually think about it, you're like, well, wait a minute. People change when they feel a purpose to do it. It's not about not being changed. You know, if somebody wants me to change and do something different, uh, if I can stop and think a little bit, and if it's something I want to do, I'll do it. So it's not that I'm resisting being changed. Yeah, I'm open for the suggestion. Sometimes I'll do it, sometimes I won't. But when we feel a need to do it, that's why we got to go to cause and purpose and get away from urgency. If we feel a need to do it, we'll figure out how to do it. And that's what we have to do is change people. We have to sort through that, that mess and try to understand, you know, what you could say it, what's in it for me, which the change community uses a lot, but yeah, I think when we see these situations in enterprises where, and I've been in enough of them to see that, you know, they've been doing this for years and years and years and nothing's really different because they don't need to really do anything different to a certain degree. Um, so how do we go deeper and focus on something that's more meaningful? Yeah, I think that uh, starting with the purpose is interesting. It's something that um, comes up all over the place, right? Why, why do we want to make this change in our organization? Why do we want to add this feature to our product? Why do we want to create these metrics, right? The starting with why is really sort of, I guess in a lot of ways, sort of the base of all of this, right? It, let's stop doing things if they don't make, if, if there's not a good reason for us to do them. And let's start doing the things that have good reasons for us to do them. The, the movers and influencers will take it. There's always gonna be those catalysts or those movers who wanna do it and they influence people around them. It's always going to be people on teams that want to come in at nine and leave at five and just get their five user stories and get them done. And that's it. And that's fine. That's, that's the way teams are. Right. So if it, the catalyst or the movers are the people that are really going to inspire the people around them, um, not necessarily us as the change people. So if we focus our energy on those movers, mm -hmm. they will virally help spread change. Yeah, they'll, they'll amplify the message, right? Yeah, for sure.
Awesome. I, I want to um, sort of call back to a quote from when you were uh, your presentation and Deb mentioned it in the chat. Um, get curious, not furious. I think that's um, something good for us all to remember sort of all the time, right? But let's start asking why people are doing the things that they're doing rather than just getting angry at them for doing them, right? Uh, they're they're going to behave how they're going to behave. And if we can understand why, then we can start uh, start creating better environments and, and doing better things for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard because we're stuck in the middle sometimes, I think. And I know I'm guilty of this a lot. You forget that 100% of our job is thinking about change. And 1% of the people who actually have to do the work, 1% of their thinking is about the change. They're focused on delivering stuff to customers. Um, so they can never go as fast as our brains go. And that's tough, especially if you're internal or even external and you're getting pressure from the people at the top to get more results and you know you can't force it, you, you get kind of stuck in a spot that's uh, pretty tough. So if you can try to be congruent at the start um, about that approach, it might make it a little bit, a little bit easier, but hmm, sometimes it's a little harder than some organizations and others. Awesome. Um, it, are there any other questions? I don't no, see it's it. really good. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Jason. Um, just uh, a long day, and uh, I think um, I know myself, and maybe others, or maybe we're out of gas here. Maybe it's just yeah, been a. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, uh, that was good, Jason. That was, uh, and I'll check out your website um, and see because I, I definitely see some application. Uh, for you know that exercise because uh, it just opens up a lot of dimensions that otherwise would not have ever been discussed or at least looked at and I think it just kind of forces that conversation and so thank you for that You're welcome uh, before we conclude I just have one last question uh, generally we say uh, tell people the what and why and leave the how to them because they are near to the how is this also true with change? Do we leave the how to the people? I always found it to be too hard to separate those things. They're they're too intertwined for me personally. Because um, if you know, at, at its worst, it can be you restricted the how by telling them the why. If it's not framed the right way, so. I don't know. I, I have a hard time separating those three things and I would more leave it up to conversation about just simplified language where, where, and why are we stuck and what are we going to do about it? And that kind of helps you have the conversation about why we want to do this. Cause you can always go back and go, why are we doing this again? And I don't think we do that a lot in change. We kind of presume that we can define the marching orders and the purpose at the start and then go into execution mode, then we never kind of go back to, well, oh, wait a minute, why are we doing this again? Cause it's really hard. Like, is there maybe, are we misaligned on something? So in theory, yes, I would agree. In practice, I, I find it just personally hard to, to separate those things. Yeah, that's right. So I really get confused when I get into such conversations trying to uh, reinforce some ideas here sounds good in a tweet though <laughs> it's a good marketing for you awesome uh thank you everyone for coming i really appreciate it and thank you jason um also wanted to thank lean dog uh for sponsoring the meetup i really appreciate that as well makes uh life a little bit easier for me um so thank you very much. Uh